Thank you for being with us. This is the second part of the program. We're now joined by Dr. Anna Borge, um, who is a director at the University of Malta. Uh, perhaps, Anna, can you expand a bit more about your current uh, position? Okay, for now, I lecture at the University of Malta. My background is in gender studies um, in relation to the world of work. And till October this year, I occupy also the post of director of the Center for Labor Studies, where we teach, um, we have various courses at masters, at degree level, and, and research. We, we also carry out research. And thank you for coming to carry on our chat, which we had some time ago about the proposed reforms to um, the change in the prostitution law. Thank you very much. Before we start on this, I'd just like to refer, we're speaking, refer back to uh, Professor Semple, who I think uh, gave us quite a lot of information today. Um, Mr. Greg, I quote from your recent article in the Sunday Times, where you said a handful fundamentally wrong decisions triggered a disastrous domino effect. I suppose, I mean, the question is, I mean, should the government be doing more? Obviously, uh, one has to trace back to how all this has effectively happened. So we've moved from a nation, from a country which took this <clears throat> pandemic very, very seriously initially and has managed to actually register a very strong success. We were one of the countries which everyone was talking about to, WHO actually raising more on how it handled the public health crisis because it left the decisions in the public health crisis in the hands of medical professionals and public health professionals. But strikingly enough, you know, we managed not just to ruin all that success, but to practically go to the extreme opposite of the spectrum. So we, we had a country which we were proud of in the sense where everyone was so proud of our public health professionals. They made so much sacrifices. They have given up so much, not for money, but for the country, for public health. We ditched all that. The country ditched all that. And that's where I was referring to a handful of fundamentally wrong public policy decisions. So that we are in a situation today where, as we've heard from the public health announcements that were made today, our country is one of the highest risk in the uh, European Union, not to mention uh, across the world. And ultimately, everyone has to understand that where public health is concerned, public health is a direct impact, a direct effect, a direct outcome of public policy decisions. Yes. And just to mention one, because there were a number, but just to mention one, no one, no one in his right senses could understand the decision of the government to allow mass events like uh, parties, like, like, like parties which had hundreds of people in very restricted destinations just in the beginning of July, which have led subsequently to this domino effect, which led us to where we are today. Absolutely. You know? So in my opinion, there is a strong responsibility that all politicians need to carry, but government has a much bigger responsibility at least to allow public health officials to run the decisions that are related to our public health. Thank you. Claudette, what have we learned from Professor Semple today? Well, I think it's I think one of the most important thing. Ironically, Anna has referred in her introduction to what she does. We need to research properly what the situation is like. And we need to listen to what people are telling us. I think as politicians, and, and I think Claudio put it perfectly, we have a responsibility. And the responsibility is not for us to be the heroes of a situation and come up with decisions which may contrast completely what facts and what research is showing us. We have to really sit back and listen. And there are moments when it is not for us to take the decision per se, but to follow what we are being told we should be doing. Yes. And I think that is the big mistake which happened in, in July. And the mixed messages, I think, Leah, mixed messages were a disaster, total disaster. I mean, you can't 
come up with expressions like, you know, you'll find the waves in the sea and, you know, we can go to the beach and do whatever we like, etc. And now we are at a stage, you know, where we have to reverse all that. Yes. And as Claudio said, we all sacrifice so much. There are so many viewers watching us who have not seen family and not, not hugged loved ones for such a long time. And, and what are we telling them now? Sorry, we made a mistake, you know, but these mistakes have huge consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Claudette. Uh, back now to um, the proposal for the decriminalization of prostitution. A uh, couple of weeks ago, I was joined by Her Excellency Marie-Louise Colero Preca, and we just have a very short clip just to see where we left off with her and then pass over to Dr. Anna Borg. I'm very concerned, Leo, but uh, I am also part of a national coalition that has been formed um, uh, last year. It's, uh, it's a huge coalition. I think it is a, a very first one um, for this country. A coalition of 40 um, uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations that come from across the spectrum. Um, uh, these are organizations mostly that work with and for women, but again, I mean, there's the most liberal to the, maybe to the conservative. This, this, is, this is a very wide spectrum where we all agree on one thing, that prostitution has to be decriminalized, but not without regulation for who is selling, um, uh, uh, or rather buying, buying um, prostitution. So uh, what we have been saying that there's a, 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 a number of recommendations which are very, very important who have, who have been presented to um, Honorable Julia Farrugia when she was parliamentary secretary and it was within her remit, um, this, this, this reform. This was, I think, in October of last year. We are concerned because we have offered as a national coalition um, concrete recommendations of how we should go about it. In no way we want the prostitute to be criminalized. We want the prostitute to be decriminalized and given the, 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 uh, the supports and the care that is needed so that um, the person will come out of um, uh, uh, prostitution. One night I spoke to myself and I prayed, I cannot take it anymore. It is enough. Sandra's a very strong woman. She actually crawled out of a small window. She dropped two stories down. I closed my eyes and I jumped. I just felt the fresh air and I was alive. She ended up getting up and running away. We get a phone call, a woman claiming she was uh, held against the will and forced into prostitution. One of the detectives was trying to trace back how she got to the precinct. Sandra said, that's the house right there. We crashed the place. There was two other victims there. There was something like close to 10 male customers. Arrests were made and uh, the case was prosecuted. Chandra told me how she was in a dark room when she was kidnapped and how she never saw sunlight. Mandari means sun, sunlight. What we do is we help survivors of human trafficking. Housing, food, clothing. We provide vocational training to earn money and live independently. This is empowerment. Firstly, of course, uh, as somebody who's dedicated his wife life to the welfare of women, I'm against any form of exploitation of women. We cannot tolerate exploitation of women. And we know that all the glitters is not gold, so all that looks nice and shiny. Beneath, there's a suffering woman, very often a suffering woman. Um, so there, there is the psychological well-being of a woman. There's her welfare. She well fed. Um, is she addicted to anything? Is she be, uh, how badly is she being exploited? Um, are people holding on to her passports, for example, things like that? We, we get these, these, these social issues. There's the medical issue, of course, uh, because we need a much stronger sexually transmitted diseases uh, department to look after a vast increase, for example, in, 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 uh, in, in sexual activities as, as promiscuity. Um, and, and I think we have to, it, it really is a wake-up call in a way. It's a wake-up yes. call that our society is changing. Thank now. you for having me. I'm honored 
to be with you, to be with Leah in this specific program about human trafficking. Thank you. And thank you for being brave, for standing up and voicing. Um, your, your strong voice is very important for women to encourage them to come forward. Thank you. That was a short clip from a few weeks ago. I'd like to uh, pass on to Dr. Anna Borg. Where are we in Malta with the, these proposals, Anna? Well, I have to say the proposals are still not very clear. We um, do not have a document where we have kind of clear indications where the government is intends to go with this with this reform. What we know is that um, there is a clear call for decriminalizing the person who is caught in prostitution, and on that I think we all agree. Um, we know that most people who enter prostitution do so when they are very young, before they are 18, so we have to kind of ask whether they really consented. Um, some were groomed, you know, they were coming from um, poor families where they had, um, you know, issues, very um, social problems, and so kind of it's easier to groom them. Um, some have mental health issues. Um, so I think there is agreement that you, the person who does enter prostitution is not criminalized. And on that, I think there's a clear message coming from government. And it's also the message coming from all uh, women's organization and this whole coalition. There is also a second element which I think, uh, where I think we are also agreeing, where we are saying we need to offer support because we know that whilst the vast majority of people caught up in prostitution want to exit, it is extremely difficult. Once you're caught in prostitution, for many different reasons, it's extremely difficult. And with more and more people being trafficked, the situation complicates itself because then you would have housing issues, you would have people having their visa, you know, which perhaps needs to be extended. Um, so, you know, support is another, I think, one of the other points where we are also agreeing. Where um, I think the biggest problem and, and the biggest discrepancy lies is that government seems to stop there. Um, government is saying, you know, we will decriminalize people in prostitution and we will offer them support. Um, if you just do those two things, essentially, because you have, I think we have to make it very clear that at the moment prostitution in Malta is not illegal, you know, so what are you exactly going to decriminalize? Um, perhaps soliciting, um, perhaps, I think, hopefully soliciting, you know, and, and again, there, that shouldn't be a problem. But I think the moment you stop on those two points, when you are opening up and kind of making it very clear now that there are no controls, you immediately send a message to traffickers and to pimps that Malta now is open up for a new kind of business where you, you have absolutely no controls, where everything is going to become legal. And that uh, raises alarm bells for people who are concerned about the increase of trafficked persons, but I would say in their majority young girls and women for um, to enter prostitution, because this is exactly what happened in other countries where they opened up. Sure. Um, the moment you, you, you open up, um, there's an increase uh, in demand, and so uh, there has to be an increased supply. Where are you going to get, you know, the supply of girls and women to, uh, in a, a growing market? And there is where uh, the issue of trafficking comes in. So essentially you open up, uh, you make Malta a hub for sex tourism and uh, you are essentially as well increasing without perhaps realizing uh, trafficking of, of persons sure. for um, the issue of, of doing prostitution essentially. I think there is a bit of a problem Claudia, perhaps you can address it. Some people um, cannot um, see the link between human trafficking and prostitution. Can you explain it in very simple terms? Well, I think Anna has just explained it yes. very clearly in, in her lo the last part of her intervention. And this is where we need to, to listen 
to, to what the coalition is, say, is saying, because the coalition is made up of, uh, of uh, quite a large spectrum of NGOs, but also there are experts and there are researchers there, and they are showing us clearly um, what, what may sound strange, you know, basically opening up and, and just decriminalizing is going to open the gate and turn Malta into, into a hub, like, like Anna is saying. So uh, what really, really worries me is that we've changed um, from Julia Farugia to Rosianne Kutayar as parliamentary secretaries responsible for, for this issue. And what really, really worries me is that uh, Rosianne Kutayar has not consulted as one should do at length with um, this coalition. Right. I, I do not have the feeling that um, this coalition has been heard. Um, I think um, the people advising uh, Rosianne Kutayar basically are people who are telling her what she wants to hear, and which is basically stopping right where um, you, know, you decriminalize and you help um, the prostitutes to come out of it. That is not enough. If we are not going to do the next step, if we are not going to look into seriously how we're going to control the volumes of people who are going to abuse, seriously abuse. Um, and, and you know, we don't need to invent the wheel, Leah. This is what worries me. There are patterns of other countries, other we places when where this has happened, yes. and things have run out of hand. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they, they would, in Maltese we say, they would bite their elbow no, to, to, yes. to basically try, yes. try to reverse the situation, and they can't. This is the truth. And we are in a situation where we can predict a disaster in our society. And instead of saying, okay, let's, let's listen to what everybody is saying, everybody, okay? No, we're just listening to the few. You know, it's like uh, we're talking about happy hookers, we're talking about, you know, uh, sex workers. We don't even want to address the issue as prostitutes who are usually very vulnerable people. As Professor Brinkart said in that program, a few weeks ago. We're talking about women who are also victims of substance abuse, alcohol, etc. They can't even face a day. Sure. You know, sure. And, and you need to listen to what these women and the NGOs who are helping them really closely, what they tell you about these stories. They're shocking. And this is happening in Malta. There is trafficking already in Malta, Leah. Yeah. Okay? We know that um, in gentlemen's clubs, basically, you know, one club, you know, barters for two other women, one woman, and they exchange so that you have a change of women all the time. Can I ask, is this still going on uh, during COVID-19 and all the restrictions and precautions? Anna, would you know that? I wouldn't know. Um, I would say from, you know, reading what is happening around the world, um, it has been, you know, this industry has been affected. So, um, that for example, in, in Germany, there was closure of, of some of the br main brothels and so on. But eventually, I think, you know, people caught in prostitution at some stage, they still have to pay the rent. They still, you know, if they have children, they have expenses. So some of them have had to take, uh, you know, a lot of risks and go back. And, and this is where... I think this is another point which we have to make because a lot of people would tell you, well, this is like any other work, you know, and no, this is not normal work, you know, which normal work um, exposes you to, uh, you know, getting STDs, to getting pregnant, to HIV, you know, where you can be beaten. I mean, if that happens in a normal job, <laughs> the other guy or the person doing that to you would be sent to jail. But, Absolutely. you know, so um, I think I would say it has been, you know, subdued. But then uh, with the opening up, as, as has happened in Malta as well, the message is that now we're opening up again yes. for such business, you know. Uh, Mr. Greg, how do you recommend that the government uh, can work more closely with uh, people like uh, Anna and uh, the NGOs uh, uh, that she's uh, fronting? Look, uh, people elect politicians to enact legislation and to make policy. Now, Enacting legislation and making policy, in our opinion, is based on two simple things. 
firstly, that legislation is based on evidence, not on thoughts, not on whims, not on personal ideas, not on personal wishes, and principle, which in our case, in this particular issue, is a very, very strong under and underlying one, which is the protection of vulnerable people. Now, when we as an opposition headed into this discussion, internally in the parliamentary group, we created a small working team, which was composed of Claudette, Carol Aquilina, and myself. And what we did, the first thing was that in the Social Affairs Committee, we had a delegation which was led uh, by Professor Borch, which came to Parliament in a very, very prepared manner, and they delivered to us a very detailed presentation exclusively based on facts. Not on what their opinion is, not on what individually what they think, but based on facts, researched with statistics, with key studies, quoting uh, studies that have been carried out and presented to us in the Social Affairs Committee, which was clear that if you are a politician and your principle is to protect vulnerable people, then there was absolutely no doubt whatsoever that you had to follow the recommendations that this committee was making, which particularly one of them was the application of the Nordic model, which criminalizes the uh, buyer side of the equation. I would like to close my intervention with uh, a quote of an American politician who once said that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And unfortunately, the government is trying to use its opinion, to use the opinion of some of its politicians, to transpose that onto facts and to tell people that they would be protecting the vulnerable by decriminalizing also the purchasing of sex. In the Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Greg. Steve. Very briefly, Anna, I mean, we've only not even scratched the surface, just very briefly to close today. Okay, well, I think I, I have to stress that the position which we presented uh, both to the opposition and, and to government, um, the, it took us quite a long time. I mean, it, we have been studying this for about two years and the coalition is made up of a mix of academics, lawyers, medical doctors, people who work directly with people in prostitution. So um, our only aim is to, as um, the Honourable Claudia Greg said, is to make sure that we protect vulnerable people, whether these are women, whether these are gay men or trans. The whole idea is to make sure that we do not open up a business which would increase, um, you know, vulnerable people becoming victims of thank you. this industry. They're telling me we're running out of time. I mean, we've only scratched the surface. I thank you very much. I'm with Dr. Anna Greg, um, Dr. Anna Borge. I'm really sorry. I apologize. Uh, the Honorable Claudio Greg and the Honorable Claudette Buttigieg. Thank you very much for being with us. Stay safe. Good night.